feeling of being overwhelmed, we simply have no choice but to be active. Tonight, we hope to show you how. How it's done. Oh, great. We're all here. Um, we've got six incredible panelists. I'm not gonna um, I'm not gonna introduce them in full because I wanna keep us going with our time. Their bios are in the program. They are amazing. I am completely honored that they are all here to um, to uh, to share their expertise with us. Um, somebody who couldn't be here, but I want to give them a shout out is State Senator Dale and Leach. Dale and
very concerned about what we're seeing happening in Washington, but we're not looking at what's happening in Harrisburg. And I've got a folder here full of bills that I think you would find pretty interesting in many kinds of ways if you even knew what they were. But they often don't get reported and you don't really get to see how your representatives and your senators got to vote. There are ways of finding out. It's not as hard as you think it may be to really get involved and to really understand what's happening. So I hope that we can get inspire you to start looking at what's happening there and how you can help to make change. And real practical advice on how, you know, how to talk and how to communicate with legislators. I always say to people, look, I am one. Not everybody likes what I do. And so I hear it and I understand and I respond to it. And I can tell you what in our offices, and I think Representative Sims can do the same thing, to tell you exactly what really impacts us and what we put in stacks and count, rather than really looking at what the, the message is. So I'm excited again for all of you to be here and look forward to your questions in the conversation. And Committee it gets assigned to. 
Um, most bills die in committee and never even make it to the floor for a vote. So once you find out where your piece of legislation has been assigned to, you want to make a list of all the people in that committee and then approach them to support your legislation as well. You want to be bipartisan. It's natural to assume that a Democrat's going to support your issue or a Republican is going to support your issue. But going into a meeting, you have to work both sides. Because in reality, especially here in Pennsylvania, nothing is going to pass without Republican support. Um, so when you go in, you're going in to talk about your issue, not necessarily push a party's in general's agenda. I think one of the other most important things to remember is that you need to listen. It's one thing to go in and to explain and, and, and sort of demand what you want to happen, but if you don't understand what the opposition is, you can't come back. So if they're opposed to you, ask them why, and ask them to explain to you what the issues are that is the hang-up that's preventing them from supporting you, because if you don't understand your enemy, you can't defeat your enemy. Um, if you've never read The Art of War by Sun Tzu, I suggest that you do, and look at it through the lens of advocacy as opposed to, to the military. There's lots of good advice and insight in there. Next is you want to educate. Odds are that they're opposed to you because they have some preconceived misconception about what it is you're actually asking for. And in that vein, a lot of times it's not necessarily willful ignorance on their part, it's just they simply don't know. Legislators are asked to consider a bunch of different issues and they can't be experts on all of them. So you need to make sure that you provide them with the information that they need to make an informed decision. And when you do that, you want to make it personal. If this affects your life or your family member's life, share those stories. Putting a face to an issue makes it personal and makes them much more inclined to, to actually listen to you. And then, you want to make sure you're asking for something. You don't want to just go in and say, support X issue. You want to say, I'd like you to support this piece of legislation. I'd like you to amend this piece of legislation. I'd like you to oppose this piece of legislation. If you don't have legislation introduced, then you want to specifically ask them to introduce legislation. Because until there's actually a bill to work with, you, you basically have nothing. Um, and then also, uh, ask for more than what you're willing to settle for. Our first uh, <laughs> approach with the industrial hemp legislation, um, we knew we weren't going to get what we want, but what we ultimately ended up with is something that we're happy with. Um, and then on the legislation, ask for hearings. A lot of times they'll, they'll introduce legislation and then it'll just sit there and languish in committee. Um, asking for hearings makes sure that they get to hear from experts and not just a small group of people who want something and that all the information gets out there. Um, the other thing we learned is don't focus on just one chamber. The Senate is definitely easier to deal with. Uh, they, they tend to be more reasonable and there's much to be more of them. So it's a... Uh, it's no <laughs>
definitely keep in mind that if, even if you are successful in getting your legislator to introduce a bill that you'd like, there may be other groups supporting legislation that you might not like so much. Um, organized lobby days. Uh, get a group of people, make your target list and try to schedule as many appointments as you can for one day. If you call the uh, capital services, they will allow you to set up a table in the rotunda where you can pass out information. Set teams to go have meetings and have somebody man your table that can uh, pass out information. Um, use the media. The media can definitely be your friend because you can reach many, many more people a lot easier with one press story than you can by a million likes and shares on Facebook. Um, so hold a press conference and invite the media to come. Uh, write op-eds, letters to the editors, things of that nature to try to keep your cause and your issue in front of the people. Um, don't get complacent. Once you get legislation passed and it seems like it, it's moving, you can get the sense that, oh, this is just going to finish and get over the finish line on its own. No, it's not going to. You have to stay on top of it every step of the way. Uh, and lastly, don't give up. It can be a little bit frustrating, but as Margaret Mead said, never believe that a small group of caring individuals can't change the world because indeed that's all that ever has. Thank you. Can everyone hear me? Um, and so those are all critically important, but it was that last one that led me 
down a road a couple of years ago when I was talking to an organizer from one of the paid organizations in Harrisburg at the fourth rally of the month. And he said, hey, we're going to have a fifth rally. And I wanted to stream my stuff. And so, <laughs> and because, you know, we, I, what, what differentiates this and what's happening now from everything that came before it as of like October and then beyond, you know, going backwards, was the numbers. You have incredibly smart organizers. You know, doing everything right, but you have numbers on top of that, like we have never seen. And so, for, in our, for our purposes, rallies were becoming a very sort of worn out tactic. And so we would stand there in the Capitol Rotunda with our signs, and people would be standing on the set, well sweltering, holding their signs and banners for an hour, like when people like me would stand in the front and talk about something boring in front of bankers' boxes where we would have petitions that we would deliver to some party who didn't care that we were there. And you know, the press wouldn't show up, the public wouldn't know about it at all, and so it really seemed like, why are we even doing this? And so I asked that of a different organizer a couple of days later when I was inventing, and he said, I think we have rallies all the time because we don't know what else to do. And I thought, well, heck, give me a couple of minutes and I'll think of something, and I know that's true for everybody else in this movement. And so in that moment, my mantra became interesting targets, creative actions. I am not interested in having another rally unless I think there's a good reason to have a rally. I am interested in going after targets in a creative way if I'm going after a conventional target, especially sometimes we still do have to do that. But a lot of times I love looking for the interesting targets who aren't used to being targets because sometimes they're actually flattered. And you can make a lot of headway with people who aren't used to being targeted in that way. I mean, honestly, it's really funny. And so, um, and so that's what we always try to figure out. And so one of the things I recommend as you do strategic thinking into what you're going to be doing moving forward is to uh, talk about power mapping, which can be used for a whole different bunch of reasons, but one of the things that I like to do is to look at the target who can give me what I want, and then think about who can influence that target. And so it could be in the case of a different kind of power mapping where you're looking for people who actually know that person, like a barber or a hairdresser. But um, the kind of power mapping I'm talking about with respect to targeting is to look for people who actually build some influence themselves. People who we can go to, or bodies that we can go to, for instance, like a lower government calling on a higher government to do something, going to township supervisors and getting them to call on state government to do something. They're not as used to being targeted in the same way that Judy and Brian and all of our legislators are. And so it's much more effective sometimes to go to them. And so that's the kind of thing we try to think of when we're thinking about who our interesting targets might be. Um, one of ours at Herb Staff's Truth was the Pennsylvania Democratic State Committee where we got them to vote for a statewide moratorium on fracking. And honestly, when we were lobbying and calling them up, they were tickled <laughs> to be getting phone calls because they never got phone calls before. So, you know, it can be very, very effective. Um, and then finally, I'm saying these things because I think you actually have so much momentum you're not going to need them for a while, but one of the things you're probably going to encounter because of just how many issues are out there that you're taking on all at one time is that you're going to have a hard time getting your message heard above all the other ones. And so, you know, even though I don't worry about your numbers and our numbers because I feel like I'm a part of me, but, um, you know, even though that's not the issue right now, and I pray it never is, but, you know, really it is helpful to be as creative as you can be to kind of get your message heard above everybody else's. And in that way, I think protest is actually being an art form. Because actually, you know, we think of art as being a way of, of communicating a message, a form of expression that's intended to elicit a reaction. That's what protest is. And so if you've ever gone to art school or music school or theater school, somewhere along the line, somebody has told you, learn rules, embrace the rules, and get them ingrained into you, and then put them aside and go get creative. That's when you start improvising. That's when you start learning jazz, you know. Uh, and so that's what we need to do, I think, as a movement. I think we have to also, and this is, this is a general piece of advice, I think we need to be elastic. We have to recognize that at some point life is going to take over. What's happening now is this renewed um, spirit of civic engagement. I have been saying for a long time, and I think one of the first casualties of busyness is civic participation, civic engagement. And so what's happening now is that we've reshifted our priorities in terms, you know, in the way that we can put civic participation at the top of the list, because we feel we need to, but we can't continue to do that all the time. And so movements need to be elastic in the way that somebody needs to step back can, and somebody else is going to step up. So we take care of ourselves and we take care of each other. That's critical. And the other thing is we need to keep drawing people in, and that's where I highly recommend that we use those very creative methods to go after people. But right now, take that in, think about it, but honestly, you're doing great. Just keep up the good work. Thank you.
our Good Women's Law Project. Um, and I also want to say that even though I've been doing work, this kind of work for a long time, it's really good to hear it again and to be refreshed. So it's, it's uh, great to be on this panel. Just a few words about us. I mean, I do love being called the, the, the lawyers for the women's rights movement in Pennsylvania. Um, we've been around for 43 years. We have an office in Philadelphia and in Pittsburgh. We're relatively small given the impact that we have. Um, and <clears throat> we um, work across inter the intersection of many issues that affect women. Um, uh, and we use um, litigation, high impact litigation, public policy reform, legislative, including legislative reform and administrative advocacy, and a lot of community education. Um, the areas that right now take up most of our attention, and, and in many respects, um, access to abortion has been the area that we have uh, for 40 years played a major role in, um, both locally and nationally. We've been before the Supreme Court twice. And, been involved in uh, either as counsel or counsel for a in almost every um, major case that's come before the court. Sadly, we've had an awful lot of work to do in Pennsylvania, um, and we continue to do that work. We've also done a significant amount of work in a police accountability project related to how the Philadelphia Police Department uh, handles uh, sex crimes and domestic violence, and much of that work has taken us to a national level. Um, what I want to talk to you about today mostly is the Campaign for Women's Health that we're very involved in. Um, Senator Schwenk is the co-chair of this. Um, and before I go into that, I, I also want to say, um, not just because of what happened on Friday, which was a big victory for us, but I have, um, as angry as I am at where we are, I've also um, been since maybe November 10th. <laughs> I, I went through the stages of grief pretty quickly, I will tell you, and, and wound up sort of angry and determined, but also optimistic. Um, I think leading up to this, we have seen, um, a, even before the election, a reemergence of civic engagement and social justice um, organization in, in ways that we haven't seen since the 60s and 70s. And I can say that because I've been around that long. Um, and I can see there are fellow baby boomers in the room um, who have been there with us. And, and um, I gave a speech right after, um, or shortly after the election, and it was in the Academy of Natural Sciences, and I don't know if any of you have been there in Philadelphia, but it's full of dinosaurs. And my speech was about <laughs> that's, that's right. That's right. That's what my speech was about. That I think that we are going through the flailing tail of the dying dinosaur. And the dying, dying dinosaur is heterosexual white male supremacy and patriarchy. And it's powerful. That tail is powerful. Um, and I think we're in for a lot of bad stuff. I think we know that. But I think it's coming to an end. Um, and I think leading up to this, when we saw the Black Lives, Matter, Black Lives Matters movement, we've seen young women on college campuses throw down the shackles of shame that have been historically associated with rape. Um, we have seen gay marriage. We have seen um, changes in the way the LGBT community has been treated that's seismic. Um, in all of these areas, we've seen young white men get back into a social justice movement um, in ways, again, that we have not seen since, at least in my view, uh, since the anti-war movement. So, I, and, and I think, and I, I, I frequently think of Michael Moore saying that Donald Trump's the best organizer the left has ever had. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that the movement was percolating. Um, I think it was truly and I think the intersection of issues that so many of us are concerned about, what we're hearing about on this, um, on this panel, um, and the range of issues that intersect particularly in women's lives. Uh, so I, I don't think that it was an accident that there was a worldwide women's march. When I spoke in Philadelphia, I said, you know, this might be the 
most exciting day of my life to know that there were six or seven hundred marches going on around the world, led by women, about women, but about a broad range of issues. And that, I think, is what brings us all together. So, you know, um, I think we've said we, we understand that we think globally, but we have to act locally, and we have a lot of work.